Okay, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm very happy to see all of you uh, during the storm, so to speak. Um, I'll start out with announcements that I hope will not detract you, distract you from the lesson of today. But the college, actually, I had my last Juma for the semester on Friday uh, because of the coronavirus. This co uh, college actually gave the students eight days. When I was here on Thursday, we got a, a memo, eight days to evacuate. Now, we have a huge international program here, and so there are actually a number of students studying in Italy. One of them came back and is in quarantine. Um, Claudette and uh, Gennard are in quarantine because they went away from their honeymoon and uh, so pray for them. Uh, probably having a honeymoon in quarantine could be quite nice. Um, but do pray for them. They, they contacted us and sent their love uh, and that's why they're not with us this morning. So uh, I don't really have any announcements except that we will not be having class on Sundays until uh, something else happens. And I don't know what that means except that we will be in touch with you and, and through the group and everything. Um, I'm going to take a month just to um, sort of regroup and figure out how to do this. We will look at doing something either on Zoom so that on the Sunday morning we would be able to get together and I would I think the right word is Zoom it or televise it or whatever from my study at home and then we would all be able to get together. So we will do some solicitations to see if you would actually join that um, forum or not. Uh, if it's, you know, if it's interest you to do that uh, and we'll look at that in about a month's time. So I'm going to move right into the teaching today because I do have a lot that I want to say to you. I want to try to inculcate in you what Allah and His Messenger says about times like this. Insha'Allah for bil alameen. And alhamdulillah ta'ala, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inahu wa nasta'kuru wa na'udhu bilahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati amalina wa may yahtihillahu fala mudillallah wa may yuhdur fala hadiyallah wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la sharika la wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu rasulullah indeed all the praise is due to allah the one we seek refuge with allah from our evil deeds and our sins we know that whoever allah guides no one can misguide them and those who are not guided by allah there is no guide for them I bear witness that there is no God, there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and messenger. O oh, you who believe, revere Allah as Allah alone, should be revered and die not except as Muslims. Ya ayyuhaladina amanu taqu laha haqqatu katihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. O you have believed, fear Allah as Allah alone should be feared and die not except as Muslims. Ya ayyuhan nasu taqu rabbakum aladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathiran wa nasa'a wa taqu Allah aladhi tasa'alun bihi wa arham inna Allah kana alaykum rakiba. O people, be dutiful to your Lord who created you from one soul and created from it its mate and dispersed from both of them many men and women. And fear Allah through whom you demand mutual rights and revere the wombs that bore you. Indeed, Allah is ever over you an observer. So today I want to talk about the tutoring, the lessons, the wisdom, the blessings of the coronavirus. The entire world is talking about the coronavirus. People are probably keeping their televisions on 24-7 to learn about the coronavirus. Our command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to contemplate and reflect 
on the wisdom, benefits, morals, and lessons in everything Allah presents to us in our environment. There are always lessons we can learn from what we are witnessing around us. A believer always looks at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wisdom in these things and tries to derive what Allah and Allah's messenger says about them. And perhaps the first benefit we can learn from the coronavirus is that it humbles us when we realize that none of us is powerful and that only Allah is the all-powerful. So the most powerful scientists, the most powerful physicians in the Center for Disease Control, they are powerless right now in this situation. Many people are expressing the helplessness of being human and powerless during this calamity. And it helps us to realize that no human is superhuman. No human is almighty. From the Ivy League schools to anywhere you want to look, all of us are under the powerful, all-wise, all-knowing Lord. Look at this virus. The largest country in the world as far as population is concerned is China. The most powerful country in the history of humanity is said to be America. And look at the lack of control and helplessness we seem to be currently. Nations all over the world, mighty and weak, are in terror. What they are in terror about is the smallest of the smallest, the smallest of the smallest, not Allah the greatest. So we say Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. But if you look at the energy right now, you might think that Corona is the greatest. But I'm going to show you just how small it is. They are terrified at something that is a manifestation of life. Scientists are wondering technically if the virus is alive or something between life and death. The virus is around 20 to 30 nanometers in length. And a nanometer is one billionth of a meter. And so to help you put that in perspective, that would be zero and point eight zeros, point one. We cannot even look at this virus with an ordinary microscope. Only through a sophisticated electron microscope can it be seen. The electron microscope does not bounce light off the subject, it bounces electrons off the object. To give you an idea of how minuscule this virus that has all of humanity terrified is, we need to magnify it at least 100,000 times to see it. To put it in perspective, if we took a grain of rice and expanded it 100,000 times, that grain of rice would be as large as five or six football fields. And I guess that would be whether you were using jade, jasmine rice or basmati. <laughs> From this coronavirus, humanity is terrified. And what lessons do we derive from this? There is a Lord, higher power, and despite all our technologies and all that we have become, we are not the masters of our destiny. We are not in control of our lives, much less the lives of others. How can we not humble ourselves in front of the one who creates everything? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah an nahr the bee, that he creates that which we do not know and cannot ever understand. And here we have, at least right now, an example of that. One lesson that we can learn while reflecting on the coronavirus is that there is a Lord and that Lord is in charge of us. Another lesson that we can benefit from is to appreciate that life and death are real. All too often we ignore death. And the Prophet وسلم, said, an astute believer multiplies their memory of death. All too often we become too comfortable in this dunya. We get addicted to life 
living the life of materialism and pleasure and we become complacent about the riches we have. We become engrossed to such an extent that we become heedless that the dunya is not the end all and be all. These types of calamities and tragedies are wake up calls to remind us that no one lives forever. No humans are immortal. In Surah 3 verse 185 says that every single soul will taste death. So just because we're in denial of it, we ignore it and don't think about it, doesn't change the reality of life and death. Surah 67 verse 3 says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created death and life so that He may test us. So when hurricanes, tsunamis, earthquakes and plagues come and death surrounds us, we become more conscious that hearts that might have become hard become soft. The most hard-hearted and arrogant person in times like these may find themselves on their knees crying out and pleading with the law. Our minds that have become habituated towards thinking about the dunya which made our hearts harden may suddenly begin to think about the unseen world. When calamity strikes and death surrounds us, we begin to think about the Akhara. And of course, we are humbled by this thinking. Hearts that have become hard become soft. And that is a blessing and not a calamity. If this trial wakes us up from the slumber of the dunya and makes us realize that life is temporary, then it is a blessing and not a calamity. It is a blessing in disguise and this is another lesson or benefit we gain from this tragedy. Our mortality in life is not permanent. Death is around the corner. Abu Bakr Sadiq, may Allah be pleased with him, said every single day we all wake up and death is closer to us than the shoe strap on the toe of our sandals. We wake up daily not knowing when we are going to die. These kinds of tragedies drive home the point that life is not created in this dunya. It is not eternal in this dunya. And only Allah knows when we are going to die. Another lesson of wisdom that we can extract from what we are seeing around us is the erroneous belief that some people are better than others. This virus is an equal opportunity virus, attacking all of humanity equally. And this shows the foolishness of the superiority complex whereby we think our race, people, nation, or state is superior or better than others. The virus is attacking all of humanity equally, all classes, the rich and the poor, all ethnicities, red and yellow, black and white and all socio-economic groups. In this case, privilege is gone. Every single human is equally human. Blood cells are precisely the same for every single one of us. Everyone feeling that because they have a certain amount of money in the bank or that because they come from a specific family, tribe, or nation, they are immune from this virus, all of that is dust in the wind. The message of Islam is that the only thing that separates us in the eyes of Allah is our taqwa. In this world, we are all equally human. This virus and the terror it is generating should make us realize the truth of the religion of Islam, which tells us that every one of us is equally human. All of us came from the same origin, and our result at the end will be the same. There's a story found in our history books, and Allahu Alam, Allah knows if it is authentic or not, but it goes on like this. There was a tyrannical king who was torturing the ulama, alams and the righteous people, and he was mocking a scholar in front of him, and, he was, as, and as he was doing so, some flies came and irritated the king who dutifully swatted the flies away. 
He said, Tell me, O Alam, what is the wisdom of Allah creating flies? Flies are always a nuisance. The Alam responded, Allah is using the flies to humble the arrogant of Allah's creation like you. The wisdom of having flies is to show the king that he was human, like the scholar he was taunting. The coronavirus doesn't differentiate between prime ministers and peasants, the rich or the poor, the white or the black. Every one of us is equally affected because we are one in humanity. And I just realized that I'm on the wrong presentation. <laughs> but I'm it's part of it, so that's so, fine. Come to me It wasn't me, I'm sorry. That's okay, no problem. Not me. I know that's humbling. That's very humbling. <laughs> it is important to realize that according to the Quran, a trial or test technically known as ibtila may take the form of distress, but it could also take the form of comfort. The Quran, predicts, the Quran predicts that the inclination of human beings would be to interpret the ibtala of distress to be a sign that Allah has forsaken and punished them. Conversely, comfort and opulence are interpreted as a sign that Allah has blessed us. Such a perspective is given to us in Surah Al-Fajr. Chapter 89, verses 15 and 16, in which Allah the Sublime proclaims, As for the human being, whenever his Lord tests him or her by being generous to him or her and allowing him or her to live a life of ease, he or she is prone to say, My Lord has been gracious to me. Whereas, when Allah tries him or her by restricting his or her means, of livelihood, he or she is prone to say, my Lord has distracted, disgraced and punished me. In light of the above evidence from the most primary source of Islamic guidance, we should cast aside the view advocated by some Muslims that catastrophes such as the deadly corona outbreak is a sign of punishment from Allah for the Chinese government's persecution of the Uyghur population. Now, I immediately on Thursday, I had my khutbah ready for yesterday, for Friday. And it was going to be on sacred precincts, because this is the sacred month of Roger. And after meeting with the students on Thursday, I wanted to give them a message of hope. And so you got to hear the beginning of that message. When I realized that it wasn't what I was giving you, because I'm giving you more than I got to give them. There were four million... 30,000 results in Google for Islam coronavirus is divine punishment. Now, I'm going to prove to you that those 4,030,000 were all wrong. How arrogant is that? But I promise you I'm going to give you the Quran and the Sunnah about it. This is very sad because we know that in the Hadith it says, when we meet Allah, we will meet Allah as we see Allah. And that means that 4,030,000 people see a lot as doing this as a punishment. We will revisit this, but first thing I want to get to the benefits and some lessons we can learn from the coronavirus. And I have to ask this question. A viewpoint like that, before I move on, denies the divine justice of Allah, who is al adil the absolute just. How does one account for the fact that only China is being chastised by Allah, whereas other communities of equal or greater sin and oppression are being afflicted or left unpunished? So we, I want you to think, folks. I don't want you to be brainwashed by the television and the news that you're watching and all of the emails that you're getting. I want you to be brainwashed, but I want you to be brainwashed by Allah and His message. I want you to carry the thoughts that you hear today with you because we know that this is going to worsen. So I pray that this will be a message of hope for you and a message of truth that you will know and recognize that it's hot. The first benefit we can learn from the coronavirus is that it humbles us. 
when we realize again that none of us is powerful and that only Allah is the all-powerful. Saudi Arabia has temporarily halted the entry of pilgrims entering the country to visit holy sites in an attempt to slow the speed of coronavirus. ICO, the Islamic Center of Orlando, Jama Masjid, put out an email on Thursday that said the following, the usual first half hour English talk will not take place and we will only have the bare minimum five minute Arabic khutbah inshallah. Now, I'm not here for you to get lost and fit. It is very clear that when people are endangered, I'll give you proof for this later, but just in case you're preoccupied with that kind of thinking, there is fit on how we treat these things, and this is correct. I'm not saying they did anything wrong. I'm just trying to put it in perspective that it's happening in Saudi Arabia in the most sacred precinct, and it's happening in our backyard. What the world is in terror about as I said before, it's this very small thing. This life-threatening disease, which is highly infectious, should remind us about the transient nature of life and move us all to redouble our commitment to live wholesome and virtuous lives. Maladies like the coronavirus is a stark reminder of our ultimate destinies, the fertility, the frailty of life and the inevitability of death. In Surah 67, verse 1 through 3, Blessed is the law, and to whom belongs all power and dominion, and has power over all things. The one who created death and life as a test, in order to predetermine in order to determine which of you is best in conduct. Allah is all-powerful, most forgiving. Calamities and disasters are a test, and they are a sign of Allah's love for a person. Because they are like medicine. Even though it is bitter, despite its bitterness, you give it to the one whom you love. And we can all remember when we had babies and they would be given some disgustingly horrible tasting medicine and no matter how they spit it, we would hold their mouth and, and force them because we loved them and we wanted them to get well. And now Nirvan is doing that to our kitty cat. <laughs> Despite its bitterness, you give it to the one whom you love and receiving love from Allah is the greatest love. So receiving these kinds of tests and calamities from Allah is a sign of Allah's love for us. Make sure you remember that verse that I recited to you. And remember that hadith that I recited to you. In the Sahih Hadith it says the greatest reward comes with the greatest trial. When Allah loves the people, He tests them. Whoever accepts that wins Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure, but whoever is discontent with that earns Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wrath. So I encourage you, do not be discontent. I encourage you to take every precaution, and we're going to talk about that toward the end of the lecture, inshallah. But do not be discontent. This is from your Lord, the all-wise, the all-knowing. Calamities are good for the believer in the sense that reward is stored up for him or her in the hereafter thereby. How could it be otherwise when he or she is raised in status thereby and his or her bad deeds are expiated? So through the suffering that we will go through, perhaps when we don't have as much food and we go to the stores and it's emptied or maybe one day we won't be able to go to the stores. Allahu Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said, when Allah wills good for Allah's slave, Allah hastens the punishment for him or her in this world. And when Allah wills ill for Allah's slave, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala withholds the punishment for his or her sins from him or her until he or she comes with all his or her sins on the day of resurrection. 
So imagine that all of this trial is wiping the board clean for you. Would you rather have the board clean when you get over there or would you rather have the board clean here? Al Hassan al Basri said, Do not resent the calamities that come and the disasters that occur, for, be, for perhaps in something that you dislike will be your salvation, and perhaps in something that you prefer will be your doom. Al Fadl ibn Sahl said, There is a blessing in calamity that the wise man should not ignore, or woman, for it erases sins gives one the opportunity to, to attain the reward of patience, dispels negligence, reminds one of blessings of the time of help, calls one to repent and encourages one to give charity. Through calamity the believers seek reward and there is no way to attain it but through patience and there is no way to be patient except with resolute iman, faith and strong will. Remember the words of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam How wonderful is the affair of the believer for his or her affairs are all good and this applies to no one but the believer. If something good happens to him or her he or she is thankful for it and that is good for him or her. If something bad happens to him or her he or she bears it with patience and that is good for him or her, and this is found in Sahih Muslim. If calamity befalls a Muslim, he should say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Verily to Allah we belong, and unto Allah is our return. And say the du'as that have been narrated from the Prophet Sallallahu How wonderful are those moments in which a person turns to his Lord or her Lord, and knows that Allah alone is the one who grants relief from distress. How great is the relief when it comes after hardship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah verse 2, sorry, Surah 2 verses 155 to 157, but give glad tidings to the Asabarin, the patient who when afflicted with calamity say truly to Allah we belong and truly to Allah we shall return. They are those on whom the salawat who are blessed and will be forgiven from their Lord and they are those who receive Allah's mercy and it is they who are the guided ones. I want you to leave today being among the guided ones, being very clear what Allah and His Messenger says about things like this and living it, owning it, putting it in your heart and holding on to it with your molar teeth. Because the world and people in the world that don't know what you know and what you're going to know when you leave here today are going to be very negative and doom and gloom. Muslim narrated that Umm Sulayma said, I heard the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, there is no Muslim who is stricken with the calamity and says what Allah has enjoined, Verily to Allah we belong and to Allah is our return. Oh Allah reward me for my affliction and compensate me with something better. But Allah will compensate him or her with something better. So when you see Muslims and they're struggling, tell them what I'm telling you today. Tell them to say this prayer and know that Allah is going to compensate them with something better. She said, when Abu Sulaima died, I said, who among the Muslims is better than Abu Sulaima, the first household to migrate to join the Messenger of Allah? Then I said it, and Allah compensated me with the Messenger of Allah. There are things which, if the one who is stricken with calamity thinks about them, that will make the calamity easier to him or her. In his valuable book, Zayd al-Ma'ad, Ibn al-Qayyim has mentioned several things. If he or she looks at what has befallen him or her, he or she will find that what his Lord or her Lord has left for him or her is similar to it or better than it. And if he or she is patient and escapes it, Allah has stored up for him or her something 
that is many times greater than what he or she has lost through this calamity. And if Allah willed, Allah could have made the calamity even greater. The fire of calamity can be extinguished by thinking of those who have been hit even harder. Let him or her look to his or her right. Does he or she see anything but calamity? Then let him or her look to his or her left. Does he or she see anything but loss? If he or she were to look at the people around him or her, he or she would not see anything but people who are tested either by missing out on something that they like or by having to or by having something happen to them that which they dislike. The pains of this world are like dreams or like a passing shadow. If you laugh a little, you will keep weep a lot. And if you are happy for a day, you will be miserable for a lifetime. And if you have what you want for a little while, you will be deprived for a long time. There is no day of happiness, but it is followed by a day of pain. Ibn Mas'ud said, for every moment of joy, there is a moment of sorrow. And no house is filled with joy, but it will be filled with sorrow. And Ibn Sirin said, there is never any laughter, but there comes weeping after it. It should be noted that panicking will not make the calamity go away, and in fact it makes it worse. And I'm still quoting from Ibn Kiyam. It, sh it should be noted that missing out on the reward for patience and surrender, which is mercy and guidance that Allah has granted us as the reward for patience and turning to Him, by saying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun, verily to Allah we belong and to Him is our return, is worse than the calamity itself. So imagine that if we are ungrateful, if we are complaining because of something Allah has created, we are cheating ourselves out of the great blessing of the hereafter. It's like having a bogo and not using it except it's far better exponentially. It should be noted that panicking makes one's enemies rejoice and makes one's friends feel sad. There are people walking around saying, I'm so glad that's happening to those Muslims. I told Duran that while I was searching to see what scholars were saying, and I was so saddened by the number of negative things. One of the scholars in the Shia faith in his sermon said this is a divine punishment. And he was, uh, in the, that very week, he was diagnosed with the virus. You can look it up. So imagine, so the people came back to him online and said, oh, so what sins did you commit? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we need to be hyper-vigilant about what Allah and His Messenger has said and not get caught up in this thing. It's just a thing. It should be noted that panicking makes one's enemies rejoice and makes one's friends feel sad. It makes Allah angry and makes the shaitan happy. It destroys rewards and weakens resolve. If he or she is patient, seeks reward, strives to please Allah, to make his or her friend happy and to make his or her enemy sad and seeks to relieve his or her brothers and sisters of their burden and to console them before they console him or her. This is steadfastness and a sign of perfection. Not slapping one's cheek, rending one's garments, wishing for death and being discontent with the divine decree. There are people that are going to go in the depths of despair over this. And they're going to wish they were dead. They're going to have suicidal ideations like you wouldn't believe. And we don't do that as believers. It should be noted, and I'm still quoting from Ibn Kayyam. It should be noted that what comes after being patient and seeking reward is pleasure and joy that is many times greater than that or than what he or she could have got from keeping what he or she lost. 
Sufficient for him or her is the house of praise that will be built for him or her in paradise as a reward for his or her praising his or her Lord and turning to Allah saying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Verily to Allah we belong and unto Allah is our return. So let him or her decide which of the two calamities is greater, a calamity in this world or the calamity of missing out on the house of praise in eternal paradise. In al Tirmidhi, it is narrated in the Marful report. And by the way, this is a hadith. For those of you who are new to hadith science, this is a hadith in which words, actions, approval, or a description are attributed to the Prophet Wasallam. On the day of resurrection, people will wish that their skins had been cut with scissors in this world when they see the reward of those who were struck with calamity. One of the righteous predecessors said, were it not for the calamities of this world, we would come empty-handed on the day of resurrection. How grateful should we be for that which will allow us to go with so much. And I know that it may be hard for you to hear me say this. Some of you may struggle, but know that this is truth. And this is where you want to be spiritually. It should be noted that the one who is testing him or her is the most wise and the most merciful and that Allah, may Allah be glorified, did not send this calamity in order to destroy him or her or cause him or her pain or finish him or her off. Rather, Allah is checking on him or her, testing his or her patience, acceptance of faith. It is so that Allah may hear his dua and supplication. So that Allah may see him or her standing before Allah, seeking protection, filled with humility, and complaining only to Allah. It should be noted that were it not for the trials and tribulations of this world, a person could develop arrogance, self-admiration, a pharaonic attitude, and hard-heartedness which would lead to his or her doom in this world and in the hereafter. It is a sign of the mercy of the most merciful that Allah checks on him or her from time to time with the remedy or calamity so as to protect him or her from these diseases, to keep his or her submission and servitude sound and to eliminate all bad elements that may lead to his or her death, doom. Glory be to the one who shows mercy by means of testing and test by means of blessing. And it is said, Allah may bless us with calamities even if that is hard, and Allah may test some people with blessings. It should be noticed that the bitterness of this world is the essence of sweetness in the hereafter. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will turn the former into the latter. Similarly, the sweetness of this world is the essence of bitterness in the hereafter. It is better to move from temporary bitterness to eternal sweetness than the other way around. If this is still not clear to you, then think of what the Prophet ﷺ said, Paradise is surrounded with difficulties and hell is surrounded with desires. So if we're walking around desiring that everything would be back to normal, no. We should say, Alhamdulillah, thank you Allah for these wonderful opportunities that will allow us to enter in front of you filled to capacity because of the calamity that we experienced on earth. So if a person responds well to calamity, they understand that it is a blessing and a gift, not a test. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said a calamity that makes you turn to Allah is better for you than a blessing which makes you forget the remembrance of Allah. Sometimes when the blessings are coming and we can't even count them, we just think about, look how I got all this. Look how I did all this. Look at me. Oh, I was a top performer. 
And we just go on and on and our egos are just crazy. It's insane. It's intoxicating. Instead of knowing what Allah said that we have. Letting Allah and His Messenger be the criterion of what is a blessing and what isn't. Sufyan said, what a person dislikes may be better for him or her than what he or she likes. Because what he or she dislikes causes him or her to call upon Allah. Whereas what he or she likes may make him or her heedless. Ibn Taymiyyah regarded his imprisonment as a blessing that had been caused by his enemies. The one who is called Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Tamiyyah. And this is what Ibn al qayyim said about Ibn al tamiyyah One day he said to me, What can my enemies do to me? My garden is in my heart. Wherever I go it is with me and never leaves me. My detainment in seclusion is an opportunity for worship. My being killed is martyrdom, a guarantee to paradise. And being expelled from my city is a journey. He used to say of his detainment in the citadel, if I were to spend the fill of this citadel in gold, that would not be sufficient to express my gratitude for this blessing. <clears throat> that would not be sufficient to reward them for what they have brought to me of goodness. The ones who did not believe that imprisoned him, he's being grateful to them because he turned it into an opportunity to worship. When he was in prison, he used to say when prostrating, Oh Allah, help me to remember you. Give thanks to you and to worship you well. Ma'asha'Allah, he said to me one day, the one who is really detained is the one who keeps his or her heart away from his or her Lord. And the real prisoner is the one who is captive to his or her whelms and desires. When he or she entered the citadel and was within its walls, he looked at it and said, So a wall will be put up between them with a gate therein. Inside it will be mercy and outside it will be torment. Allah knows that I have never seen anyone who was more content with his life than him, Ibn Taymiyyah. Despite all the hardships that he experienced and the lack of luxury and comfort, in fact the opposite of that, and despite the imprisonment threats, and exhaustion that he faced, despite all of that, he was the happiest of people with his life, the most content, the most courageous, the most satisfied. You could see the signs of joy and happiness in his face when we felt afraid and were expecting calamity and we had nowhere to turn. We would go to him and as soon as we saw him and heard his voice, All those fears disappeared and were replaced with contentment, courage, certainty, and tranquility. Glory be to the one who showed some of Allah's slaves Allah's paradise before they met Allah and opened its gates to them when they were still in this world of deeds and actions. So some of its breezes and fragrances come to them, which made them devote their energy to seeking it and competing in attaining it. What a story. 
What a testimony of having a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hearts that have become hard become soft. And that is a blessing, not a calamity. The next lesson we can derive from the coronavirus is that this dunya and the wealth and blessing that comes with it is not an indication of success and happiness. Another lesson that we can derive from this coronavirus is that this dunya and the wealth and blessing that comes with it is not an indication of success and happiness. The people that are innocent, good, and righteous get struck with the calamity, and the people that are evil and corrupt might not. This tragedy makes us realize that this dunya is not the end, and that we must realize there is going to be a hereafter. This virus sometimes takes innocent young children and people, not just this virus, but any calamity. Sometimes the righteous are affected and sometimes the evil people are left. This tragedy does not make us reflect that whoever has this dunya doesn't mean Allah is pleased with them and whoever has the dunya taken away does not mean that Allah is angry with them. On the contrary, this dunya is not an indication that Allah loves you. One of the scholars said this dunya is given to the one whom Allah despises and to the one Allah loves. It doesn't matter if this dunya gets taken away from the one whom Allah despises or the one whom Allah loves. This world and all the blessings associated with it are not indicators of success or Allah's pleasure. Indeed, it is the akara that is the full indication of Allah's pleasure and love. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, know that tragedy and trials are not only going to affect those who do wrong. This virus is spreading everywhere and it is affecting the righteous, unrighteous, the good and the bad. All are being affected equally. And it is our actions and reactions that determine piety, not the affliction. Those of you who are suffering from any affliction or calamity should not interpret it as Allah not being pleased with you. On the contrary, the Prophet ﷺ said, These plagues that you see, they are a trial for some people and a rahmah for others. Now imagine if you just think one way that it's just a trial for everybody and it's a rahmah for you. What are you saying? It's actually like shit. Because you're saying, I know more than Allah. Oh, no, it's a test. That's not what I've been reading to you. It's not what the Quran says. It's not what the Sunnah says. The Prophet said, these plagues that you see, they are a trial for some people and a rahmah for others, but it has nothing to do with Allah's love for you. As a matter of fact, the more you're tested, the more Allah loves you, is what Allah and His Messenger said. Money can be a blessing and a punishment. Good health can be a punishment if one does not use it for the sake of Allah. And it can be a blessing for the one that uses it for the sake of Allah. We see in this point that this dunya and getting it or not getting it does not indicate at all a person's maqam, a person's station in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We see in this point that this dunya and getting it or not getting it does not indicate at all a person's maqam in the eyes of Allah. <laughs> Instead, sometimes the best people get nothing of the dunya and sometimes they get it all. Sometimes the worst people seem to have the best of this dunya and sometimes they don't get anything of it. And the same goes for the virus as well. 
The last point I would like to make today is that we must recognize that all of the blessings of this tragedy is that there is a, power, a higher power than ourselves that predetermined what is happening. We believe in Kara. The, coronas, the coronavirus creates anxiety. The, random, the randomness of who gets it and who does not get it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran says everything we have done, we have created it with Qadr. A person can take every precaution and be effect, infected by the virus. Another person can walk into the epicenter of the virus without any precaution and not contact the virus. We have to realize there is a higher power at work here. And this is our belief in Qadr, one of the articles of faith. Imam Ahmed narrated that the Prophet Wasallam said, and don't jump to conclusions here, I beg you, Taking precautions will not help you against Cotter. Against Cotter. If all of the world came to stop you from getting it, and it's the Cotter of Allah, you're going to get it. If all of the, except one of the eight billion human beings came to make you get it, and it wasn't Allah's will, you're not going to get it. They could take the petri with it in it and put it in your mouth and you won't get it. If Allah decreed your death for you, you can wear all the armor there is. But will the angel of death, Malik al not be able to take your soul because of your protective armor? The narration is saying that precautions will not save you from one of Allah's qadr. The Prophet ﷺ said, but instead du'a is helping you against what has happened and what is going to happen. Du'a is the weapon you turn to. So I command you to make du'a, O servants of Allah. The Muslims and the Mu'min find consolation in the belief of Qadr. It does not mean that we do not take precautions. The Hadith does not say that we act foolishly. We must tie our camels to wackle. We must tie our camels and put our trust in Allah. And this is not a new thing, folks. In the 18th year of the Hijra, in the history of the Sirah, of our Ummah, one of the worst plagues was the plague of Amwas, where an estimated 50,000 Sahaba and people died in the plague in Syria. Umar ibn al-Khattab was proceeding towards Syria with reinforcement for the army when they heard of the plague. They were debating among themselves what they must do and then finally decided to go back to Medina. One of the companions asked Omar ibn al khattab are you running from Allah's Qadr? He said, we are running from Allah's Qadr to Allah's Qadr. No matter what you are doing, folks, you are always running to Qadr. Whether you're protecting yourself or hurting yourself, it's all been predetermined. It is of Allah's Qadr that we protect ourselves. But there's no way we can protect ourselves from Qadr. Whoever we, whatever we do is also Allah's Qadr. We are running from Qadr to Qadr. Q-A-D-R would be the transliteration. Q-A-D-R. The meaning? Uh, predestination. Yes. Predetermined. So going back to Medina was a bastion of safety. The plague had not reached Medina. Look at the wisdom of this. We don't run into the plague and say, Look, I'm testing the car of Allah. Because that's foolishness. There's no hikmah in that. We are running away from Qadr. We are doing Qadr of Allah when we take precautions and leave the rest to Allah. 
And as this situation worsens, I encourage you to inscribe this verse in your heart. And it's in Surah 9, Surah Toba, verse 51. Write it down on an index card. Carry it around with you. And I'm sorry I worked on this last night and didn't get a chance to do the PowerPoint for you. Say, nothing will happen to us except if Allah has decreed it upon us. Say, nothing will happen to us except if Allah has decreed it upon us. Surah 9, verse 51. Nothing will happen to you or me unless Allah had decreed it. We accept the call of Allah even as we make dua for Allah to protect us. We do not act foolishly. And I would encourage you to every day, at least once, see what the CBD, not the CBD, sorry, the Center for Disease Control, CDC, CDC is saying. That doesn't sound like that. Yes. <laughs> See, Center for Disease Control. What's the uh, hand sides doing on the side? I would actually also say um, Florida Department of Health because the CDC is a little bit more relaxed than Florida Department of Health. Right. And Florida Department of Health, so there you go. But don't be listening to all of the Debbie Downers and the Donald Downers about how the world is coming to an end and we should just buy all, fill up our basement with everything we can buy so that nobody else can get anything. Don't put your trust in the law. Just put your trust in your own brain and your own head and forget about your faith. No, that's not what we do. <laughs> our religion urges us to look for the positive. Our religion urges us to look for the positive and it tells us that life has sanctity. So therefore we try to preserve our life. <clears throat> So today we have looked for lessons in the tragedy we are facing and inshallah we have found the silver lining and lessons in this calamity. Oh Allah grant us good in this world and good in the hereafter and save us from the chastisement of the fire. Oh Allah lay not on us a burden greater than we have strength to bear. Blot out our sins and grant us forgiveness. Have mercy on us oh Allah. Thou art our protector. Help us against those who stand against faith. Amen. O Allah, let not our hearts deviate now after Thou hast guided us, Amen. but grant us mercy from Thine own presence, for Thou art the grantor of bounties without measure. Amen. I mean, Amen. I ask You to forgive me if anything I have said offended You, and if anything I have said good, then say Alhamdulillah. All the glory and praise is due to Allah.